Well, Sim, thank you very much indeed for reading for us. And I noticed some of the brokers reaching for their dark glasses at the mention of a camera. So I think they're friends from Zurich. So uh, a very warm welcome to you if, uh, if you're with us for the first time. I hope this will become a habit and you'll be able to join us every, every Tuesday lunchtime. Now, on either side of Easter, we've been considering this question, how come people do not follow Jesus? Uh, We've been studying this famous chapter 6 of John's Gospel, which has to do with Jesus' work. And whilst the chapter begins with as many as 20 or 30,000 people clamoring to follow Jesus, 5,000 men and then everybody else as well, the chapter, you may remember, ends at verse 66 on page 20 there, after this many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So you might say it's rather a dangerous chapter to preach on. You could uh, reduce the size of the congregation very substantially. People at the end of this teaching stop following Jesus. How come? Well, the chapter spells out the work of Christ, and there's no doubt that we find the vital work of Jesus in the chapter. Verse 35, we didn't have it read to us just now. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And then verse 53, just beyond our reading, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. The vital work of Jesus, the life-giving work of Jesus that brings eternal life beyond the grave to know God and to know him forever. And, of course, it is a vital work because without it we perish. And we'll have a perfect example of that, won't we, tomorrow as the coffin goes up the steps into St. Paul's. However indefatigable one may have appeared in the prime of life, that's how we will all end up. So there is the vital nature of the work of Jesus. It is essential. And without it, you perish, I perish. We've also noticed in this chapter the universal nature of his offer. You would have seen it in our reading today, but it comes over and over and over again. Whoever comes, I will not cast out. Whoever believes shall never thirst. Everyone who looks on the Son and believes shall have eternal life. Anyone, verse 51, who eats of this bread will live forever. And then verse 56, verse 57, and verse 58, whoever, 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 whoever. Whoever you are, whatever your past, wherever you've been, whatever you've done, if you come to Jesus and eat the bread, his bread, he says, eternal life. And so in the light of this work, its vital nature and its universal offer, how come people don't follow him? I mean, it's, it's amazing, isn't it? You think it's such a wonderful offer, eternal life. It's to anybody. It's free. And yet at the end of this chapter, vast swarms of the 30,000 have disappeared. Well, before Easter, we studied every man. Um, I don't know who the man on the Clapham omnibus is. Somebody will be able to tell me afterwards. But uh, before Easter, we looked at the crowd and the 20, 30,000 who chased Jesus around the lake. What was it that caused them to stop following him? And here we're dealing with you know, your next-door neighbor on the tube, the person who works at you in the next-door desk, secular man, every man, the crowd. And we discovered that actually they wanted a political messiah, a sort of political fixer. He wouldn't do that. His kingdom is not of this earth. They wanted a materialistic messiah, somebody who would provide them with the next meal, somebody who would feed the world. He wouldn't do that. They wanted, once they realized he was religious, they wanted religious works to do. He wouldn't give them religious works to do. Do you remember? Who shall I make the check out to? Once somebody discovers you're on about religion, that's the question they always ask. Oh, who, who, what money do you want? Who shall I make the check? He wouldn't do that. The work of the Father is to believe. And then, once they realized uh, that we had to believe, they wanted a kind of circus pony messiah who would just perform magic tricks on demand. And he wouldn't do that. And that surely is what causes the crowd to stop following. He won't dance to their tune. 
He's got a much, much more important agenda than just a political fixer, or paying your mortgage, or giving you religious works to do, or performing some other supernatural sign to make you feel happy. He's come to give eternal life. You desperately need it. Without, him, without it, you will perish, as we see tomorrow. But now, in the section we've moved on to today, the audience has changed. Now, I don't think you will have noticed this because we didn't read it, but just look across the page to verse 59. So I think it's over the page on page 20. Just glance down at page 20. Jesus said these things while he was in the synagogue at Capernaum, but the first half of the chapter he was on the beach on the Sea of Galilee with the crowd. And therefore, at some point between verse 35, he said to them, the crowd, and verse 59, he has moved from addressing every man, the man next to you on the tube, your next door neighbor, whatever, to addressing the theologically educated, if you like, in the synagogue. And I take it the move comes in verse 41. Do you see there? The Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Up to verse 40, the crowds. After verse 40, the theologically educated. And therefore the question changes slightly, doesn't it? It's not why doesn't every man follow Jesus. It's what is it that offends the theologically literate in Jesus? What is it they don't like? Why is it that they won't accept him at the East London Mosque? When they say he's a great prophet, why won't they actually follow him? Bevis Marks, just over there, the synagogue. Why won't they follow him? Why won't the Jews in the synagogue here? Why won't the theologically educated, those who believe in God, why won't they follow Jesus? And the answer is there, well, in our verses. And it has to do with his identity and his work. And this week we're going to look at his identity and next week at his work, we're not going to finish chapter 6, the week after, I'm afraid I have to go to America for a couple of weeks. I will be back, God willing, and I hope we will finish the chapter sometime before 2014. So today, we'll just take one point, his identity, and you can see that from verse 41 and 42. The Jews grumbled about Jesus because he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. Now, here they are, theologically educated. Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I came down from heaven? Good question. And the point is a very simple one. Look, we know your mum and dad. You played with our Freddy at his fourth birthday party. You came to Jemima's bar, or uh, anyway, whoever she is, bar mitzvah. We've got your school report. How can you say you came down from heaven? How can this human being possibly claim to be divine? Do you see the issue? So the issue then is what is known technically as the incarnation, and our creeds have it that Jesus is God's only Son, our Lord, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Or, the Nicene Creed, he is one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, God from God, light from God, very, light from light, very God from very God, true God from true God, and so on. And this doctrine of the divinity of Jesus, that this human being could possibly be divine, has always been a stumbling block to the religious from the very earliest days. So you will find it amongst your Muslim friends, happy to have him as a prophet, Divine? No way. You will find it amongst your Jewish colleagues. Happy to have him as a man of history. Divine? No way. And you will even find it, it probably won't surprise you, in the Church of England. I mean, I was too young to uh, remember the first publication of the then Bishop of Woolwich's book, The Myth of God Incarnate. But when I was at theological college, considerably later in the 1980s, I was taught that there was a great quest for the historical Jesus that had begun in 1906 with a man called Albert Schweitzer, and that really any reasonable person couldn't possibly believe that Jesus was supernatural, and therefore we had to cross out all the bits that appeared to be supernatural in the Gospels because we needed to search for the historical Jesus who can't possibly have been divine. It was going on in the theological faculty in Cambridge in 19... whatever it was, I can't remember, 1988. And then in the 1990s, the Jesus Seminar, someone you may have heard of, 
um, uh, that was invented by a man who was aptly named Robert Funk. And uh, they held that Jesus was a kind of wandering sage, a sort of faith healer, but not really divine. And then last year, the report published, believe it or not, 2,000 out of 10,000 Church of England clergy, 50% of all those who responded, of the 2,000, 1,000 of those who responded, do not believe in the virgin birth. Indeed, the modern church movement, modern church people's union, only 8% of their clergy believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. Their council includes four bishops and the Archbishop of Wales. So here is a very a profoundly disturbing doctrine to the religious that a human being could be divine. And that leaves us asking the question, well, of all people, why won't religious people accept Jesus' claim? It's actually not that unreasonable, is it? If there is a God who loves us, who made us, if there is a God who's interested us at all, it's not that unreasonable that he should become human. Is it that unreasonable? So why won't religious people who believe in God, is it an intellectual thing? Or evidential? Is it philosophical? Well, Jesus gives us the answer. And let me tell you, Jesus' answer is absolutely not where I would begin. And I hope over lunch we might discuss it a bit and think, why is it such a brilliant place to start with the religious? Just look at verse 44. It's fascinating. So they said, hang on, we know your mum and dad. Jesus said, Stop grumbling. I love that. This is the way to deal with a religious skeptic. Stop grumbling, modern church union. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. Now, this is a fascinating place to begin, isn't it? You're incapable of recognizing my identity. You can't possibly come to me on your own. You're powerless. So Jesus begins then from the divine perspective. His religiously aware congregation cannot see who he is and cannot come to him because they have not been drawn by God. And just in case you think I'm reading too much into this, just turn the page to sentence 63 and 65 rather, and you'll see Jesus underlines it again in sentence 65. The issue is still his identity. This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. So here is the point. It is quite simply beyond our grasp to fathom out that Jesus has come down from heaven that Jesus is divine. It's beyond you, and it's beyond me. You cannot respond to Jesus unless he enables you. And therefore, this invitation which goes out to everybody, if we are to make sense of it, it actually requires divine intervention. We can't work it out. There is a glass ceiling, if you like, beyond which your human reason cannot advance, and this knowledge is closed to you and me, the divine invitation has to be matched by divine intervention in order for us to grasp it. Now, very interesting. The modern church union chairman, I, I read up a bit on it because I thought it was such an interesting thing to have so many clergy. I mean, it's a bit like sort of a CEO of an insurance company not believing in insurance, isn't it? To have a bishop who doesn't actually believe Jesus is divine. It's rather a str I mean, I don't know how you get into a position like that. I, don't, I mean, come and tell me afterwards. How do you manage that to be the Archbishop of Wales and not to believe in the virgin birth? I mean, it's bizarre. Well, maybe he does. Maybe he's one of the 8% that do. Anyway, you'd hope he wouldn't line up with the movement. Listen to what the General Secretary of the Modern Church says. Clergy faced with intelligent and educated congregations have to think very carefully about how to pr present complex issues. In other words, you believe in the virgin birth, you must be thick. It's extraordinary, isn't it? Now this explains, doesn't it, why you can have one person here and another person here both with the same number of GCSEs, both with the same level of promotion, equally scientifically minded, both with the same religious or non-religious experience. One saying, yes, I believe Jesus, and the other one saying, no, I don't. It's not actually to do with intellect or education. 
is to do with whether a person is drawn by God or not. Now, I'm aware that this offends deeply our 21st century sensibilities. Doesn't, doesn't it offend you? I mean, I can see one or two of you, even as I'm speaking, sort of thing. And it's hard to teach on, because I've, it's very difficult to get to the bottom of. I wonder if the trouble is that we've grown up thinking that everything is within our grasp, that we're kind of free agents, that we can do as we choose, that we can have what we want, and that everything is within our capability. But actually, there are vast numbers of things which we cannot fathom and that we're not free to achieve. So you're not financially free. You can't have what you want. You're not morally free. You can't do what you want, thankfully, because some of the things you and I have wanted to do this morning, we shouldn't. We're not geographically free. You can't go where you want. I mean, I'd love to be on a beach in the south of France. I, I can't do that right now. We're not intellectu intellectually free. We don't know everything. We're bound by time. We're not immortal. So we're not actually free. It's one of the great lies of the liberal movement that we're free. We're not free. I asked um, Philip Jensen, some of you may our Australian friend, to come and speak on this subject uh, to the evening congregations. I knew it was a bit of a thing. And I thought, well, he's pretty strong on this sort of thing, so I'll ask him to speak. Anyway, he gave a, a magnificent talk, and he said... Uh, you're not free financially, he's Australian, you're not free intellectually, you're not, uh, maybe, I'm sounding American, whatever it was, you're not free. And then he said, what kind of idiot believes in the freedom of the human will? <laughs> Which point, I, I thought, well, you've gone slightly further than perhaps I would have done. <laughs> I felt rather nervous at that point. But actually, it's a nonsense that you're free. And in one area that you are certainly not free, you are not free spiritually. Because of our human rebellion against God, because of our rejection of God, we are bound over, and says Jesus, to the religious. And of course, it's a brilliant thing to say to the religious, because the religious think they can do it through their own religious work. And therefore, to the proud religious, Jesus says, no, 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 you can't come. You can't work this out unless I let you, unless the Father lets you, rather. Actually, it's not that bizarre an idea, is it really? I, I, I mean, let me try and put it sort of in a, another way. I, I, had, I went down to the, um, the wharf the other day, and I was invited by somebody um, to come up and see him in one of, these, you know, one of these offices that every now and then you get to see into, usually, I suspect, when you're in trouble. But it's one of these sort of top offices, one of the really kind of big ones. And um, so I went up there, and I saw this guy, whatever he is, he's head of this, that, or the other, I don't know. I wasn't in trouble. Uh, and as I came down, I was thinking about this, pondering, and I thought, I suppose us being able to work out God would be a little bit like a termite being able to work out the monthly diary of the CEO of Citigroup. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just a nonsense. You can't, you, you can't work him out, nor can I. And if, if I could, God would only be as big as, as me. And you can't work it out unless he switches the light on, unless he draws you, unless he enables you. So why is it that the religious of all people don't respond to Jesus? Because, it seems, they're not drawn, is what he says. You can't come unless the Father draws you. Verse 44, no one can come to me. Here we've got a real problem, haven't we? Because verse 40 this is the Father's will, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I'll raise him up. And then verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father allows him. It's a, it's a real problem, and I can't answer it for you. But both things are true. It does raise for us, I think, many questions, and uh, as many questions as it has answers. And here is one question. How then does anybody come to know who Jesus is? How does anybody come? If you can only come if the Father draws you, humanly speaking, how does a person come? And verse 45 answers that question for us. And here we discover the divine invitation which is made to all is only responded to appropriately by divine intervention. And that requires divine education. Have a look at verse 45. 
It's written in the prophets and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. The divine invitation requires divine education. That is, we need to be teachable. I mean, all he's saying really is, if you're not prepared to come humbly to God and say, I'm utterly powerless, I'm like a termite trying to work out the CEO of Citigroup's weekly diary. I haven't got a clue. I really need your help, Lord. Unless I'm prepared, as it were, metaphorically, to get on my knees to God and say, please, this eternal life business, I know I need it, but please show me. Unless I'm prepared to say, please show me, unless I'm teachable, there's no way. Just look at the verse again, verse 45. He quotes Isaiah, describing the people of God, that they will be people who have been taught by God. And now look at 45b. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. So why is it that the religious won't respond? They're, they're, they're actually incapable and unteachable. If you're unteachable, you'll never, you'll never respond rightly. You'll never see. But if you're prepared to come in humility and say, please, Lord, teach me, then he'll teach you. Now, it's not as if there's no evidence. Of course there's evidence. We've seen the evidence. He turned water into wine, healed the official son, raised the lame man, fed 5,000, walked on water, gave sight to the blind, Lazarus, raised him from the dead, his own resurrection. It's not as if there's no explanation. Of course there's explanation. We've heard his words, I and the Father are one. We've got his Father's words, the whole of the Old Testament. There's no lack of eyewitness evidence. So is there a lack of evidence? No. Is what he has to say illogical? No. Is his offer etern of eternal life unattractive? No, it isn't, is it? Does it offend human reason? No, it doesn't. It stacks up. Is it bad for society? No, it isn't. I've got this great book here by William Wilberforce, A Practical View of Christianity, where he argues for what he calls the superior excellency of the Christian faith. Is it bad for society? No, it isn't. So how come people won't respond? Well, because actually we are incapable without God's intervention. The invitation requires intervention. And because if we're unteachable, and I was, again, I was trying to think of a, a way of perhaps illustrating it. You know the old DIY? I mean, there is the way to test a man's marriage. The old, you know, self-assembly stuff, you know? Um, why is it that, is it, a, is it a gender thing? Maybe it's just me. I suspect it may just be me. Why is it that you don't want to follow the instructions? Do you know what I mean? You sort of think, ah, oh, well, we'll put it together ourselves. To this day, there is a greenhouse on my father's farm that arrived as a steel and glass assembly kit, and a section of it is made of wood because we put it together without the instructions. We got to the end of it, couldn't make a tail of it, so we had the last bit's made of wood. And uh, I don't know, maybe it's just our, our, our own home, but there's no worse moment more threatening to our marital relationship than when I am struggling with the DIY and my wife appears at the door and says, hey, darling, have you thought of using the instructions? I don't swear at my wife, I never have in our whole marriage, but that's the closest it's ever come. And what she should say is this, you're incapable, don't be so arrogant, follow the instructions. And that really is what Jesus is saying here. Oh, you religious, you think you know everything. If only you'll come to the Father on your knees, I'm incapable, Lord. And if only you'll listen to his teaching. And I think the end of verse 45 is beautiful, isn't it? Everyone who has heard and learned, comes. Isn't that humbling? There's nothing you can do. You may be the CEO of whatever it is, or, or you may be, you're on a, we're on a level. None of us. There's no way in. None of us can come in and say, oh, well, I worked God out, or, you know, I worked God out when I was in the theological faculty. Or, no, you can't. Oh, I bought my way in, you know, or I bulldozed or bluffed my way in. No, you can't do that. It's humbling. It's challenging. Nobody in the city can come unless the fathers get on your knees and pray. Pray for the city. No one will come to the father unless he draws them. Ask him to do it. Pray. Give half an hour a day to plead with God 
to bring people from your office to know him personally, to give them a desire. It's encouraging. You know, if you stick your L plates on, whoever you are, if you stick your L plates on, everyone who comes to be taught by the Father will come to Jesus and have eternal life. And it's wonderfully liberating, isn't it? You will end up in a box just like Mrs. Thatcher has. You will. You will perish. You will face God as your judge. You will. The day is coming. But if you will come to Jesus to learn from him, he says, he will give you eternal life. Let's pray together. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Our Father in heaven, thank you that it is your will that everyone who looks on the Son and believes should have eternal life. So please make us humble and please, Lord, make us teachable. In Jesus' name, amen.